I couldn't figure out what the bald guy's tattoo was supposed to be. Baldy was seated at the table across from me and seven other armed special forces guys, and he had some type of winged creature tattoo on his chest, perhaps a nod to his Bolivian ancestry. The faded black wingtips crawled out of his shirtlet and seemed to threaten strangulation. The waitstaff materialized with enough liquor to loosen every stiff collar. They attended both our tables with the gusto reserved for large groups of government employees who were clearly going to use taxpayer money to cover the evening. At a three to one exchange rate, the restaurant stood to make a windfall. The senior DEA agent from my table was talking to Baldy. He was the only guy at his table speaking English. The other four goons created a huddled mass of black denim and leather jackets muttering amongst themselves. I nervously watched their hands in the corner of my eye, not totally sure of who they were or their intentions, but I was sure that they were also packing heat. I shifted in my chair and my sidearm rustled under my windbreaker. This was my third deployment to South America. I had been unable to get to Afghanistan. Iraq hadn't even kicked off yet. I was partnered with Mel. Seven years older than me, he always reminded me of Danny DeVito's penguin character from Batman Returns. <laughs> Mel was a Puerto Rican with a speech impediment that made his English and Spanish equally unintelligible. <laughs> this was our first chance to work with the senior operators and the boss. Mel and I had never been to Bolivia before, but we picked up on the nuances of counter-narcotics work pretty quick. The mission was simple, but the tasks were abundant, varied, and spread throughout the country. I went to Bolivia to work with the DEA, leading the charge against the coca growers in that little part of the world. Mel had more years in the military than I did, but what he had in experience, he lacked in perspective and mental flexibility. <laughs> Mel and I were enjoying what appeared to be marginal competency in working drug busts, usually unsupervised ones. I assumed our dinner meeting with the DEA agents was to update mission progress and make any necessary changes. La Estancia was one of the most expensive steakhouses in Bolivia. The wait staff buzzed around us like hummingbirds on a porch feeder in the summertime. The Fogo de Chao in downtown San Diego would have been a distant second to the food and service in that restaurant. We ate like kings who hadn't seen civilization in too long. I was just trying to end the meeting and the dinner so I could get back to the hotel. I could feel the meat sweats coming on. <laughs> I only knew that the restaurant meeting was with the DEA, Although one does not strap weaponry under one's clothing to attend a dinner meeting, not expecting company. I watched as a group of four goons walked in and heading directly for our meeting. Baldy led the way, the inky wingtips emerging from his shirt like daggers. Adrenaline coursed through me and my pupils dilated before I even understood. The hunched posture of the goons, a few hidden hands, instantly the meat sweats evaporated. I sized them up, most hands where I could see them bulges in the same places on their coats. The goons behind Baldy mirrored my actions. I wondered who in the room would die first. Noting the tension, the DE, senior DEA agent crossed in front of our table and met with Baldy. Shaking hands, they sat to my right at the only other table in the back of this restaurant. Oh shit, this dinner wasn't meeting, wasn't chance. DC is busting my balls here, I need something for the cameras, quipped the DEA guy trying to be nonchalant. Baldy understood. Times are hard for us, senor. You have already jailed so many of our couriers. The DEA guy backpedaled. Well, your Bolivian military police are getting better at their own investigations, he said. With very few Americans in Bolivia, all the counter-narcotics work was done with and through local military police and other networks, and rarely above board. Our guests could have been from anywhere. That's when the bald guy dropped the big one. You will need to let our shipment get through then. He was calculated, curt, and non-negotiable. My mind careened. I'm sorry, what the fuck? <laughs> was this guy a tango, and did he just secure a drug shipment with a guy from the fucking DEA? A guy that was, was, was supposed to be on my team? The 51% rule states to do what 51% of the room is doing, and you'll be fine. I was pretty tipsy at that point. Everyone looked chill. The senior operators across the table took note of the conversation and barely blinked. I shot a concerned look to my left at my boss. He gave me a calm stare. I relaxed, grateful to not go all John Wick on a full tummy. <laughs> 
The DEA flashed a toothy grin to both tables in an attempt to de-escalate the tension. Mel was the only guy visibly uninterested in de-escalation. <laughs> Everything was black and white with him. We joked that spending all that time in the conventional world had handicapped him, uh, handicapped his ability to work in our industry. And there I was, sitting next to him, also having to come to grips with the fact that the world is just shades of gray. The idea of right and wrong, black and white, fell away as suddenly as walking backwards off a cliff at night. I joined the Army in the mid-90s to alleviate human suffering worldwide. <laughs> I watched the news. I watched the news cameras show Black Hawk Down live in 93. I saw our troops try to make Mogadishu a safer place and their corpses were dragged through the streets. I thought I could do better. I thought I could really help. The towers fell as I was earning my Green Beret. Seeing the DEA wheel and deal with the very targets I was sent to interdict early on in my career sent me sideways. The bureaucratic structures in place make it so that no one singular person can change it. As a lone soldier, I, I had no way to affect my situation. As much as I wanted to save the world, the powers that be had the upper hand and I was stuck. I looked down at my empty rum glass. I could have asked for another and the waiter would have delivered it. But as my idealism started to fade, I figured the best thing to do would be to switch to water and things how, watch how things unfold. Mel, on the other hand, didn't handle the disruption to his monochromatic worldview well. He drank more and he started to piece together who our guests were and where they fell in his own personal hierarchy of good and evil. He began subtly suggesting that we should detain, if not arrest, the entire group. <laughs> the boss reminded Mel with a tone and a glance that made it clear that there would be no further discussions, that we had no arresting authority in the country, and the rules of engagement prevented any type of overt aggression without any provocation. As the rum continued to impede the effectiveness of Mel's executive center in his brain, his eyes darted between the goons at our, and our table. He realized the futility of arresting the gentleman at the next table. He began nervously shifting in his chair and the two pound metal bulge under his coat knocked against it. The Beretta M9 felt heavy under my arm as well. The 14 rounds in the magazine plus the one round in the chamber always seemed to double the weight. With the tritium sights and the trigger weight reduced from 15 pounds down to six meant that Mel and I would have significant advantage with the first shots. I lost track of the hands of the two, goon, two goons. They were staring straight at Mel. Was I the only dude seeing this? Another operator on my team elbowed me in the ribs to let me know that it was Mel's bedtime. <laughs> Check, please! I could feel the goons watching us as I took Mel outside for some fresh air and a fresher perspective. In the parking lot, the high mesas of Cochabamba greeted us with a pleasantly cool breeze that added oxygen to our thoughts. The sunset behind the mountains cut a light show of orange and red hues through the surrounding trees. I dumped Mel into the back seat of the Ford Ex uh, armored Ford Explorer. He treated it like a pulpit as he doled out his sermon. Dirty ass politicians have no place in the drug war, he slurred at me. They don't want to win, they'd be out of work, they're clearly on the take. My worldview similarly battered, I shared his disdain and we tried to piece it together. Dude, that is a bold accusation without solid proof. I don't have the macro view on this and neither do you. There's a lot of weird shit that happens down here. I replayed the events in my head and, try and I struggled. There were too many questions unanswered. Like what, Mel said. Coño pendejo, I have no idea, I replied. <laughs> There's always thugs wanting to put the cops on their rivals. You know the saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. I heard the sound of my words, but I wasn't sure I believed it. Bullshit, primo, was all he could muster as his breathing became rhythmic and the snoring started. <laughs> I spent three and a half years on that untenable mission. Long time in the drug war for nada. Three and a half years in five countries working with local military and law enforcement units. Three and a half years running around on taxpayer money trying to validate our existence without actually solving anything. And the hard truth of it was, at the same time, Afghanistan was a hot mess and Iraq was about to kick off. We all wanted to go play in those sandboxes with their relaxed rules of engagement. 
As the wars in the Middle East ramped up, the South American trips became more of a working vacation between Iraq and Afghanistan. And due to operational constraints, I was never able to discuss what happened with my leaders. Specifically, shortly after our dinner, the Bolivian president and vice president waged a civil war using the military and police units that we were using with the DEA. My team holed up in a hotel for three weeks while the civil war progressed. And the civil war ended with both politicians losing to the actual power broker, Evo Morales. The head of the drug makers union was elected president of Bolivia. <laughs> yep, there was a drug makers union in Bolivia. Because when it came to logistics and organization, narcos made Jeff Bezos look like an amateur. If this was how the governments and their leaders were going to run, uh, operate while we waged the war on drugs, I sure as hell didn't need to get all bent, uh, sideways over a sketchy dinner party. I tossed, a, <laughs> I tossed a couple of Tylenol on the hotel breakfast table for Mel the next morning. I knew that the work in South America wasn't ever going to get the results that were hoped for, and neither was I. You good, primo? I asked. Fuck it. Let's go to work was all he could muster. That was Joe Hudak! What did y'all think of the first half? Let's get another round of applause for Jordan, Kate, Kirsten, and Joe.